Because they have certain different traits on them. Would the crossover make makes them unique at the, you, the four at, unique at the very, very end yeah. of minuses two, right? Four unique sperm. That's right, because each of them would have a tip or no tip from the other chromosome. That's right. So in this picture, this is a horrible picture, unlabeled. But mitosis is what we have on the left over here. Meiosis is right here. Notice what we get. What would this represent? The end of what? Meiosis 1, right? So this is a great, since it's unlabeled, it's a great place to put in 23 chromosomes right here. So write 23, right? Or you can just write N, but it is 23 chromosomes over here, 23 chromosomes over there. Or you could write 23 dyads over there, 23 dyads over here. And what was up here? 23 tetrads. So this represents what stage? Metaphase, and that would be Prophase in an early prophase, right? Okay, but this is the end of meiosis 1 right here. These are your products of meiosis 1, this category. And then they're skipping all the events of meiosis 2, but these are the products of meiosis 2 right here. Well, at least getting to it. Then it would, what, split down, right? No, actually, no, here we go. 23 there, 23 there, 23 there, 23 there. So that is the products. I looked at it wrong the first time. So that's, what's, that's what I hate about these pictures. They don't label them correctly. That would be 23 chromosomes on each of those last four cells, the end of meiosis 2. Okay. In this picture, if you wanted to use it, go right ahead. It's just uh, some people like it, some people don't. Everybody uh, understand what the crossing over was in prophase and such, in metaphase? Okay. So here's what we're left with, right? This slide is just showing you that at, in meiosis 1, as it's going through meiosis 1, you are a primary spermatocyte. Before you split, after you split, what, is, what are you known as? secondary spermatocyte, right. So at the end of meiosis 1, you'd be known as a secondary spermatocyte. Then when you start meiosis 2, you're going through meiosis 2 as a secondary, and then you end up being a spermatid. So the arrows are just kind of continuing, and then you mature into a spermatozoa sperm. This was a very, I guess, because I have to hold this to pick up my voice. It's tough to do this lecture holding something. It would be a lot easier not holding something. <laughs> Sorry about the confusion. Now this picture is even more confusing. Because <laughs> it makes it look like, how many, I want to take a poll, how many people think that the sperm is swimming up? <laughs> it's what it kind of looks like, right? That's not what's happening at all. The picture is actually sequencing going downward. So that is of no help, is it? But if you look at the meiotic cycle, this is what we're starting with, the stem cell, right? And then the growth in meiosis 1, meiosis 2 as it goes down. So this is what it's trying to show, right? This is the meiotic cycle happening. And then you're left with the spermatids, and then they, they're just growing and developing. But this picture I hate. So ignore everything on the right. I think it's kind of useless for helping to understand what's going on. Although this over here is useful. Because at least you see, this is what I want you to pay attention to, at the end of meiosis 1, what are you known as? And you are N, right? After meiosis 2, you are still N, but you're known as a early spermatid. So that right here, that little box right here would be the most useful of this picture. Okay. So we know that during spermiogenesis, a different term here, this is just the maturation, the cytoplasm being lost and gaining a tail, forming a tail. 
Sertoli cells are just part of these supporting cells that help develop the sperm. All this being guided by FSH, by the way. Spermatogenesis being guided by FSH. Okay, the same as the uh, follicle being maturing is what really the meiotic cycle is going on in the female, that being also guided by FSH in the female. Okay. So getting the FSH and LH to come out, because LH is all testosterone, FSH is spermatogenesis, both of them basically are working together in this case. So FSH and LH are basically synergistic with each other. Because the more testosterone you have, the more sperm development you have. The more FSH you have, it helps the sperm development. So they both, in this case, are kind of helping each other. But the LH is definitely more so for testosterone development, which aids in proliferation of sperm, yes, right? But it's the FSH that actually helps the, the sperm to mature. Does that make sense? But LH feeds off of that. So they both work together in this case. For the female, what does FSH do? Follicle maturation. And then what does LH do in the female? Estrogens. Estrogens. That's right. Okay. So the interstitial cells give us testosterone stimulated by LH. Okay. Certainly, it's all negative feedback. What's odd is, is that uh, bald, male pattern baldness tends to be known to be from high levels of testosterone. Isn't that odd? <laughs> it doesn't help the whole stereotype of horny bald men, but uh, <laughs> I just found that interesting. <laughs> Okay, secondary sex characteristics. What does testosterone do in the male? Deepen the voice, guides certain hair growth, right? Voice, uh, excuse me, skin thickens, becomes a little more oily, and bone and muscle mass increase. So those are just things we learned, I think, way back in sixth grade. Nothing new. All right, getting to the female. The last few slides are just going to be on the uterine ovarian cycle. Just talking about the follicle developing, this is a once a month type of thing. So before birth, this is what we already have, a finite number of oogonium, right? And then here we get the primordial follicle, which is going to be arrested in prophase one, present at birth. All of the eggs are basically existing in a primordial follicle. So this is all sitting in, uh, sitting in the cortex of the ovary. All the primordial follicles. Each month, right at the start of puberty, all the way through menopause, each month this primary oocyte over here in the meiotic event, known as a primary follicle in the follicle development, right, will just keep proliferating into a secondary follicle. So every month, once a month, one egg will undergo this follicle development, right? And this is stimulated by FSH, okay? Stimulated by FSH. The maturest follicle that we have is known as the graphene follicle. This is the one that will undergo the ovulation of the egg, right? At that point, it's a secondary oocyte that's ovulated. And if it's fertilized, what happens? If it's fertilized, this corpus luteum will start producing all the progesterone, right? and estrogen that's needed to get the uterus ready if it's fertilized. If it's not fertilized, what happens to the corpus luteum? It just kind of, you know, within 10 days or so, it kind of just dies away and scars up in the cortex of the ovary. But meiotically, what happens? If we have fertilization of that egg, that's when we finally are able to complete meiosis II. So what you should pull out of this picture is in meiosis one is completed here, right? When? Each month, 
when we ovulate an egg, meiosis 1 is completed with an LH surge, and that's what we'll see. But meiosis 2 is only finished when you have fertilization. Otherwise, it's just, you know, just dies off and gets discarded. When you do have fertilization, notice only one egg is really used. The other ones are considered polar bodies. They're just discarded. They're immature, and nothing will become of those. So if we do have fertilization, this is where the corpus luteum steps in. It becomes a, a temporary organ until the placenta can take over roughly into about the third month. So from fertilization to that third month where the placenta is fully developed and now can nourish the baby, the corpus luteum is secreting what? Progesterone to help keep that uterine lining full, right? So it can implant the baby and keep it there. Right, and then eventually it does give out and then the placenta takes over. So in both situations, fertilized or not, the corpus luteum will die off. The difference is if it is fertilized, the corpus luteum sticks around as a temporary organ secreting progesterone. If it's not fertilized, it just degrades in about 10 days compared to roughly 90 days. Okay? All right, so this is what um, the follicle and then the oocyte terminology coming together. Just It starts primordial, then primary, then secondary. The oocytes here, you are always a primary oocyte within what stage of meiosis? In meiosis 1, you're primary. You end meiosis 1 as a secondary, right? Perfect, okay. And that's what we ovulate is a secondary oocyte. Talking about the corpus luteum, once we have ovulation, that will be known as the corpus hemorrhagicum. Then the corpus luteum starts to do what? It can secrete the progesterone if fertilized, right? And if not, it degrades in about 10 days to become the albicans, turning into basically scar tissue on the uterine cortex, or excuse me, the ovarian cortex. All right, last few uh, pictures here. You've seen this one in lab, I think. Realize this picture is only showing you a cycle in a circular fashion. That's not really, it doesn't behave really in a circular fashion. I'm just showing you like that in this picture. You would have scarred uh, corpus albicans all throughout the cortex of the ovary. But at least it's showing you now what the stages would be, at least in that example. So there's a simple shot of an egg mature ovum here with the follicle <coughs> as they're harvesting, you know, to try to make a baby. One of my patients was actually a, uh, a reproductive technologist, whatever they call them. Really cool. She made babies every day. <laughs> and she sent me three of her patients that couldn't get pregnant. Uh, not, I'm not a stud or anything. I'm just saying she sent them to me for chiropractic. That came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so three of the, that's terrible three of these women now you've heard it all right three of these women it was the coolest thing in the world right they couldn't get pregnant for years and then through about six weeks of chiropractic correcting the nerve pressure at L1 to L3 it allowed their whatever happened you know whatever happened they could get pregnant so that's really really cool and now I get to see their pictures on Facebook but yeah I should be careful how I word that at the beginning of that story. <laughs> okay, so for the ovarian cycle, uterine cycle, it really is quite simple. Just follow these pictures here. I added this uh, recently just to let you know there is somewhat of a flip-flop of FSH and LH there. FSH tends to decline a little bit, but we get a surge of LH, and that's what triggers ovulation. So please know that. We trigger ovulation by a surge of LH, definitely. Usually, FSH and LH kind of keep together, right? But here we get a really strong surge of LH, which triggers the ovulation of the secondary oocyte. Then after ovulation, it's known as the luteal phase, right? Because it's all about the corpus luteum at this point. Now that's ovarian, that's what's happening in the 